Well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to everyone who is still coming in the room and, and joining us. Um, this is the third one. Uh, this is the third session in NAVA's um, um, advocacy program for 2020. It is fantastic to have so many of us here as, as, as usual and what we've been doing as people have been coming in because it takes a while to, um, uh, to see who is here and who's in the room. Oh, Mary has already read my mind. Mary Wolfler from Art on the Move in Perth has read my mind. I was going to say, why are you coming in the room? Tell us who you are and where you are today. Kerry McKenzie saying hi. Um, uh, we've got um, more and more of us joining, which is just wonderful. As you come in, um, uh, let us know. Oh, hello, Lucy from Ghana country. Uh, Kerry's in Toowoomba. Julie Gibbs from Gympie Regional Gallery. Hello. Um, oh, the, up on the floor. Oh. Bachelor country on the Fraser Coast, fantastic. So many of us. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Um, now in the last few sessions um, of the NAVA Advocacy Program, we have had a good few hundred people join us. And because it does take a little while uh, for people to come in, to make sure that uh, everyone can hear us, um, we'll just um, continue to follow that chat and see everyone letting us know where they're from. Tell us what country you're on as well. Um, it'd be great to know where everyone is. Um, uh, and accordingly from Watch a Ballot Country and Natamak, hello again. Um, oh, there's Joanna from Samstag. Hello, Adelaide, uh, over there in Ghana Country. Um, it's really astounding, actually, um, just seeing not just the range of us from around Australia, but those of you from overseas. Um, and so a special hello to everyone who is... Um, really pushing the time limits and the time differences. Um, it's, yeah, really, really fantastic to, to, to see so many of us. Um, towards the end of our discussion, oh, and there's Michaela Nutt again from Luton. Hello, Michaela, up at 7 a.m. Luton time over in the UK. Um, and accordingly saying, so great to have you here, Wesley, um, which is super. Um, I'm gonna do a few, um, introductions and thanks once we kind of get going but for those who are really keen for um, the live captioning link um, uh, we've got Helen our live captioner she is based in Brisbane hello Helen and there is a, a live captioning service um, and one of my colleagues is going to post that link um, uh, soon so that we, um, we, we we can all see that it's a super useful thing to have as you're as you're listening. We're now up to 83 of us, 84 of us um, coming in. Thanks, Helen. Helen's just posted the link there, which is just now on the bottom of the chat with our live captioning. And as those of you who followed, who've uh, been here for the past weeks, you'll know that, of course, we're recording um, and as well as making the captioning um, available, we will also transcribe this session um, and that will be available um, soon as well. And of course, the first two are already up, um, which is great. Um, so um, before we, you know, formally start, um, Nadina Dixon, Gadigal Wurundjeri Yuan Woman, where are you today? I am in the heart of Black Heart of Sydney in Redfern. So um, I always feel powerful and connected being in this space and making my art from this, you know, rich um, historical community. And Wesley, you have got mood lighting. Um, New Knuckle Medium and Wesley Enoch is somewhere that looks extremely, extremely elegant there. And it's interesting, we've noticed this. And we're going to notice as we go through as the months pass that, you know, night will fall in, in, in this eastern part of Australia. So all of our lighting is going to change. In fact, I forgot to turn my light on, which means that I'm going to have to get up at some point. Wesley, where are you today? Uh, I'm here in Gadigan Country in uh, Surrey Hills. So just neighbouring to Redfern um, and just uh, growing my beard very slowly as everything else is happening very slowly as well. 
<laughs> it is that yeah. chance to, you know, do those things that, um, you know, my, my hair is much shorter than it has been for ages. Now, Penelope is just asking me a very important question, which is double checking that I'm recording. And I totally am. I, I, I press the record button. The little red thing is on. Um, and, and that's making me very happy. Uh, so, yep, yeah, that is that is totally happening. Um, there's now around 100 of us here and welcome everyone. And thanks so much for noting where you are. Uh, Mary Wolfler on Wajid Nunga country over uh, on the other side of this enormous continent. Wesley's going to be right back and I'm also going to make the be right back gesture sometime soon to turn that light on, which I'm really <laughs> wishing I had done earlier. <laughs> it's one of those, um, yeah. Um, oh, there's um, the Stafford from the Richer country in Tasmania. Ah, uh, oh, Janet from Perth also. Hello, Janet. We were texting earlier. Nice to see you. Um, oh, look, it is um, it is so heartening, I have to say, that so many of us want to have uh, a nice big conversation about advocacy. Obviously, there are a lot of obvious reasons why now's a good time. Um, oh, thank you, Julie Gibbs. It's fine now, but it's going to get worse is my worry. So um, I will wait for Julie Gibbs to say to me, when, when Julie pops on the chat and says, Esther, it's too dark, that's when I'm going to go and turn my lamp on. So is that a deal, Julie? You will let me know and I will get up and, uh, and I will go and turn my lamp on a bit later. Um, so yes, now is, of course, um, uh, you know, we often think that, you know, time of crisis, we need to work really quickly and, um, and, and develop what we need to, to get through right now. But of course, uh, this is also a time where we do need to decelerate and exhale and think in a whole bunch of different ways so that that expansive sense of the future stays with us. Uh, so as people are coming in, I'm just going to cross my fingers that I can show you uh, the outline of our advocacy program. So hopefully you're seeing now on your screens um, <laughs> what looks a little bit bit mapped, uh, which is the outline for our advocacy program. And um, ah, good on you, Holly. Thank you. Um, the another advocacy program is going to happen over the next few months, and it's going to culminate in this event here, Arts Day on the Hill, a national day for advocacy for the arts, which will be on the 12th of August, um, hopefully in Parliament House, if, you know, all of us in Parliament House still exist by then, um, but certainly an online kind of world. Um, and, you know, to get us there to really develop um, some skills in advocacy um, and to have a bunch of workshops that are going to get more and more practical as we go. We've put together this program with thanks to the uh, generosity of philanthropist Daniel Beeson uh, in um, what was last year a two-day workshop program in Canberra and then back-to-back -back meetings is now um, a free online program that we can all uh, work with and, and, and build on together. The program is broken up into four chunks of four weeks. The first four weeks are about advocating the arts and these two weeks uh, we have already had and, and um, we're now in the third week on First Nations advocacy. And then next week, um, uh, each, of, each of the four weeks has a fourth week that reflects back on the first three, just a, just a Q and A, and and there'll be a politician here for each one of those Q and As. So the first four weeks looking at advocacy for the arts and what that means. The second four weeks looking at understanding policy development. The third four weeks looking at understanding the media, and the fourth four weeks uh, looking at understanding the politics and political engagement uh, and then leading right up to all those practical things. How are we going to plan a meeting with a politician? How, how are we going to get some insights into how those processes and machinations work and how are we going to uh, refine and apply the skills that we've all newly developed um, so that we can have some great impact um, on Arts Day on the Hill but also well beyond. There is also um, an Arts Day, uh, a, a NAVA advocacy workshop um, handbook. 
And hopefully you're seeing the front page of that now, the 2020 Handbook Part 1, Advocating the Arts. This is available for NAVA members only. Um, and so if you go to our website and go to the uh, members only section, um, that's where you will find um, the special handbook uh, which includes some exercises, some that you can do individually, some you can do as groups. I've been really heartened to see on the chat the numbers of people saying, hey, let's let's connect up, let's let's do things together. And so this will give you some guidance in, in doing some stuff together, as well as um, highlighting some of the things that we've been talking about. And as promised, I have included in that handbook um, uh, something that I've just I'm just showing on the screen now and it's not going to be very very clear but I mentioned this last week um, this is my one page very brief history of arts policy in Australia which I wrote for last year's Arts Day on the Hill advocates group um, you won't be able to see this particularly well it's not particularly clear on my screen but there are three columns the Labor Party the Greens and the Liberals and Nationals and I've got from uh, the um, Federation of the Commonwealth from you know the turn of the 19th the 1900s up until today um, it's a very brief outline of what the major parties have done or dropped when it comes to arts mm -hmm. policy in Australia. So that is one of the thrilling and valuable things that you would be able to have as a NAVA member as, as part of that handbook. There will be five different uh, chapters of, of that handbook across the time. So there's now just over 116 of us. We're a good 10 minutes in. Um, I am assuming that everyone is hearing me okay. When we, in the past, we've had a couple of technical challenges in the first few minutes, but just listening or rather reading on the chat, I'm not seeing anyone. Oh, thank you, Rafa. Um, I'm not seeing people say it's, it's, it's crunchy or I'm confused. Thank you, Georgia. Which means that let us make then a formal start. My name is Esther Anatolitas. I'm the Executive Director of NAVA. I am here on the lands of the Bunwurrung uh, and the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and we are coming uh, and gathering on a lot of different places, of different countries uh, this evening, which is just um, fantastic. This is the third in our um, advocacy workshop programs. It's about developing some great skills in advocacy, doing that together and then applying them so that we can get some really, really great um, uh, national impact um, and uh, something that is not just in an emergency, not just in a time of crisis, but let's really build something that lasts. Uh, Katrina Schwartz is saying good morning from London. Good morning to you. Uh, hi, Celine from Corin. Um, and Debbie saying that the sound is great. I am very, very relieved. So first of all, um, it is my huge great pleasure and honour to introduce or reintroduce because we had the, uh, the, the honour um, of being with Nadina last week. Can I introduce uh, Gadigal Wiradjuri and Ewan woman Nadina Dixon. Nadina, hi. Hi Esther, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> I am okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's the best I can offer right now. How are you, Nunakul Nugi man, Wesley Enoch? Are you I'm okay? I'm okay. <laughs> I wanted to explain that the beard was my way of putting a clock on my time in lockdown. <laughs> now in face, I can go, I look different to what I looked like last week. So I'll just, by the time it's finished, it'll be down here somewhere maybe. Oh, oh fascinating. Now, great. Um, Nancy Lane is telling me that uh, my voice is breaking up very badly um, and that the other speakers are okay. Um, so I am, oh, and it looks like Debbie is just asking Anna Fryer whether they might, might be related. Look, this is great. Let's see if we can, uh, you know, facilitate some family connections here. That could be quite fantastic. Um, so my apologies to Nancy who is having my voice break up. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that for, for, for others it is clear. Um, but yes, here we are for a session um, that I've been looking forward to uh, for weeks and weeks as soon as we started to, to, to plan uh, this and knew that the two of you would be welcome and it would be available to, for us to, uh, to, to all be here. Um, let's talk about 
First Nations advocacy in the context of advocacy for the arts, in the context of uh, broader national political advocacy, what it means to be a citizen, what it meant uh, for our First Nations, uh, for our First Peoples to be advocates before they were citizens, uh, what it means now, what it means into the future. Um, there's um, something that um, a number of, uh, there's a number of, um, oh, what is the word? Um, there's a number of insights and, um, and, and, and the kinds of wisdom that both Nadine and Wesley have um, offered me and all of us um, over many years about this. Um, and in particular, Medina talking last week about uh, the relationship between, for her practice and um, and 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 voice practice and politics, um, for Wesley in a range of um, personal, artistic, and institutional and public roles, um, but the way that um, your advocacy role and advocacy voice works. So we're going to have a lot of different contexts and different platforms for, for, for talking about this and everyone um, there is a um, is a chat function that you've seen uh, we want to be able to take as many questions as possible um, and uh, and also to be able to have a really great conversation together so Nadina let's start with you last week um, you spoke about um, that um, interconnectedness, that, that intrinsic connection between um, your practice as an artist, the voice that you develop and the choice that you mm -hmm. find yourself making when you're kind of choosing um, choosing a, a, a medium, I guess, for a, a, a particular work or something in particular that, that, that you want to express right now. Tell us, you know, mm -hmm. just, um, yeah, tell us how for you, how do you consider that, that, that distinction, that interconnectedness between practice and voice? Um, I think it's, um, you know, about just tuning into that energy frequency of where the story world lives and um, bringing that language through, through your work in, in the strongest way that you can. And some of the mediums speak more strongly to a particular theme or, or project or um, memory that you're trying to communicate through your work. And can you give us um, a... Yeah. I was just going to say, yeah. can you give us an example of that when you're uh, when you are making something and responding to um, that 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 connection that you feel? Well, I remember. Um, I just turned 50 last year and for most of my life I didn't actually consider myself a, an artist and, and in a lot of Aboriginal communities it's not something that we sort of practice art separately from our lives. So it wasn't until I was 46 that I realised I was an artist because um, I thought when I'm singing I'm a singer and when I weave I'm a weaver, when I dance I'm a dancer. So for me, it was just my way of communicating um, through, you know, my um, connection, whichever way I was working at the time. And then um, what really sort of helped as well to reframe how I saw my own practice was an elder um, said to me, it's all the same dreaming, girl. And it doesn't matter if you sing it, dance it, make it into a monologue photograph and so for me it's just the same dreaming or the same story but just uh, interpreted through whichever form. And what did that mean to you then like to then be 46 and say I'm an artist what did that what did that shift for you or um, yeah what, what what did it make possible or what did it change? Well, I suppose, you know, like when I was younger and I was um, sort of living across two spaces, I grew up pretty um, enmeshed in Aboriginal community and I went to school speaking language and mixed English and language up. So I didn't know which words were English and which words were language. And then at some stage I thought, I've got to make my own pathway. So... Um, it was my way of sort of um, finding a place of connection to offer what I create to the community. 
there wasn't anything set up when I came through. So some of it would be like I started by translating nursery rhymes into Wiradjuri because I'd grown up around the old people and they spoke still quite a lot of language at the time. So I already had, I thought I was a native speaker as a child. So um, there weren't a lot of schools at that time, um, mainstream, in the preschools that had any Aboriginal content with any language songs. So it sort of came together as a necessity that I was finding a way to be me in a Western space and also connect through um, community. So I sort of felt like I was a little bit of a cultural translator or supporting cultural practice in spaces where culture might not sort of be um, visible. Wesley, what was your experience as a as a young one, and 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 uh, I think your experience with with, with language is, is is quite different to Nadina's. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you grow up with with certain things. I, I have lots of different language around excrement and body parts. You know, <laughs> you know especially. <laughs> um, look, growing up very much, Stradbroke Island, I mean, Jitterar and all that kind of connection and a very strong Christian upbringing as well. So, you know, you don't get a name like Wesley James Enoch by accident, it, you know, <laughs> you know, Enoch is from Genesis and it was given to our family from by missionaries. And there's this whole kind of sense of connection to the church that was part of, I don't know, the survival. Um, and I, I often like to think of the different generations of advocacy as mm -hmm you know, different, almost Maslow's hierarchy of, of human need as well. This notion of, it, for my grandparents, it was basically just human rights, you know, the right mm -hmm. to just live, this, you know, to have a life, to have enough food, to have the kind of freedoms to, to have a family and to keep that family together. And I know that the church was part of my grandmother's strategy of keeping her, you know, 13 kids together when my grandfather mm -hmm. died. And so, there was this big kind of sense of that being an important part of it. By the time you go to my parents' generation, and, and Nadina and I are the same age, this notion of going, our parents' generation, there was a very strong kind of political advocacy that was going on, the right to participate in society in, in a different way, to, to to vote, you know, to have the, the freedoms of movement, of, uh, of, of ownership, of employment, equal employment, and so that the strategies also changed around that. This idea of um, what had been before for my for my grandparents anyway, a kind of suppression, if you like, of that cultural knowledge, of that deep understanding. They held it out almost as a secret going forward because it was well, it was the reason you would be oppressed even more, or you know, sent or separated, or all those kind of things. And it became a very different thing for my parents' generation where you go actually to articulate your cultural heritage becomes an important part of a political struggle. And, you know, by the time you get to some of the, the great leaders in, in, in my family, um, like Anikath Walker, Udra Nunakal, who use poetry and politics in the same thing, to use art as a way of changing the hearts and minds of people. And then you see her two sons, Uncle Vivian and Uncle Dennis, pa both passed away now. But the sense of one became basically the Black Panther movement in Australia mm. and the other one became a greater advocate for arts. And so you see these kind of almost the separation but then also being exactly the same. And so by the time mm. we get through our parents' generation to, let's say, me and Nadina too and in many ways, the mm. idea of cultural advocacy, the idea of saying we are protecting and expressing a culture that for our grandparents was the uh, uh, oppression followed this expression and therefore turned it into sometimes an underground movement um and even i imagine you know you had the same experience where it would it, yeah. you would literally literally get it beaten out of you at school or in in different um government run in environments and that sense of what's happened in this last 50 year period from the 67 referendum on this notion of how the cultural expression and the cultural rights have become more important so we see that going hand in hand with artistic um and cultural rights kind of being expressed so the idea of the art movement from the visual arts mm -hmm. to 
to weaving to theater in my case uh mm. to 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 dance you seeing that these things are becoming more and more important and also even more important i think nowadays as we see the next generations that now we have um an inverted population pyramid in australia there are more aboriginal and torres strait islander people under 25 than there are above which is very different to the other non-indigenous demographics of this nation and we're seeing that number one um, going very well even though i haven't contributed much but the idea that there are all these kind of children and that becomes even more important that they grow up with that cultural heritage intact um that um that statistic about the younger people reminds me there is a um there's a statistic that um um i forget where i read this um but within the next um within the next 10 years or 20 years um there'll be more first nations australians than people who are here who are uh, born in england or from an english background we can only hope uh that's that, that's the that's the current projection uh which is just um yeah extraordinary medina that's um that's just a really extraordinary and 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 clear but also um um what's the word P polemical a great polemic account that was he's just given us of, of that recent history and i know that in your family you of course have had um also that experience of um um uh, family and elders being at the forefront of um, some very critical um, advocacy that has involved a lot of personal risk as well. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I suppose I was really like heavily influenced, of course, by my grandfather's um, mm. full on involvement, <laughs> you know, with um, it was, yeah, it's, it's like the story of my life and a lot of our stories um, as Wesley mentioned, like that we were under um, these particular legislations in the early days where we were basically banned from practice and our culture and it then had to sort of go down into the roots. I've heard the old people say, they said the culture's just sleeping in the roots and then it will emerge and it does emerge at times where it's more culturally safe. And I mean, in some ways, I'm a direct result of that as well with even weaving where it was assumed that Aboriginal cultural practices didn't exist. But, um, you know, there's stories of like aunties of mine weaving in secret at night. And that's the reason why we have these knowledges today. So but their power and strength and um, love of, of, you know, our, our unique culture meant that they would often be putting themselves at risk to have any sort of um, public or be able to be identified as maintaining cultural practice was an act of defiance or um, uh, was as political, you know, as you could be really, just to, um, you know, be who you are and to, to keep that cultural identity strong. So, I mean, a lot of what, yeah, Wesley spoke about is, is threaded, yeah, throughout my story. And how did that then for you, Nadina, um, you talk about, you know, coming to a point more recently and sort of identifying as an artist. And I think about mm -hmm. what that word artist means. Uh, I think about... Um, uh, uh, Richard Bell's great work uh, that you know Aboriginal art is a is a is a, a, a white fellow a white concept. Um, this notion of identifying as an artist um, has a certain um, you know it's a it's a strange thing. Uh, it's a strange sort of um, imposition of something which invites perhaps um, certainly in some ways in which we consider the art world, the artwork, the artist, you know, when we start to use those terms, we're almost abstracting the person from the work, uh, you know, we're, we're talking in a very different context. Um, for um, for a world and upbringing, a, a cultural life where um, um, the practice is indistinguishable from who you are, tell me a bit about um, the politics, I guess, of, of, of who you are and what political advocacy means to you 
um, at this stage in your practice and um, and in your community more broadly? Um, I think everything I do is underpinned. <laughs> you know, a lot of black fellows will say that <laughs> just being black is political. <laughs> as soon as you're born, you know, you 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 sort of like your life, um, yeah, intertwined with so many elements that. You know, you you at my age now, like I've become um, a um, sort of I'm playing a strong role in the revitalisation of cultural practices. So um, I trained under four master weavers, and um, as that generation is now getting older, and they're sort of saying they're more directing my age group to step up and sort of carry that um, carry that responsibility because it's a sort of like seeing it as um uh wesley and i's age group is kind of the link between the elders and the next generation but i've heard it described that it needs to come through us to get through to the next generation so there's kind of this cultural responsibility as well to see yeah. um how actively we are shaping and facilitating these processes and these spaces that in some ways we've had to become trailblazers because the pathways didn't exist or they might have been sort of started in our grandparents um generation but then we've had to sort of bring those levels up and and bring it into sort of contemporary space where um you know we embrace all our expressions of art form as equally powerful and and rich and and uh and and beautiful, you know, whether it's rap or whether it's, um, you know, uh, practices that are being passed down at unchanged, that all the lovely variety is is, is a full expression. Mm. Nadia, there's a couple of comments for you in the in, in the chat. First of all, Debbie says um, that's sad to hear about, um, you know, that having to hide those practices, but great to hear also that your cultural elders continue their practices to be able to pass on to the next generations. And Kerry McKenzie also says it's good to see you passing on your history, um, our family. Um, oh, she says she says. So that's two separate sentences. It's good to see you passing on your history. Our family and many others don't have that connection. Well, I, I mean, that's also being strengthened. So because of the stolen generations and, and the impact that those legislations had on our people, um, where a lot of the communities are, not, uh, are sharing knowledge or they're, um, you know, strengthening other pra practitioners or they're looking at how they can revitalise and research those specific localised practices. Um, so there, I think there's another layer of a cultural resurg resurgence of, of identity, pride, and sort of localised um, learning our own mobs designs is I can see that coming through in another lovely big wave. Now this prompts me to ask our, our next lot of questions, which is very much about, um, um, First Nations advocacy within community as opposed to beyond. And Wesley was talking earlier about um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of our, our, this brief history um, from a time of um, uh, questions around survival, questions around, um, uh, you know, in, in the more uh, recent decades, um, uh, referendum recognition, um, um, you know, finding that place where um, there are increasingly, I hope, um, um, well-recognised, distinct, multicultural uh, First Nations communities across the country and finding a range of different ways um, to find um, those ways of um, exchanging, advocating, um, and then the broader Australian politics, which are very, um, very troubled at the moment. Um, and a couple of questions that I wanted to ask Wesley, and, and, and the second question is, is, is going to be about, um, you know, kind of what, what needs to change. And so I'm planting that both in your mind to that next question about, um, you know, where, what are the multiple conversations and what's happening? But listening to Nadina just now, I can't help but also ask Wesley, what is it, how does it feel to then be at a stage where suddenly uh, you're an elder or you're suddenly, you're starting to be perceived as being elder? 
yeah, look, people uncle you all the time and you start to go, oh, am I ready to go to church? Okay, no. <laughs> Grow a beard like this, and people want to start to uncle you straight away. But uh, look, <laughs> that, that point that Nadina made too, it's we are at this point in time, maybe the first time in our our, our modern history since colonization, mm -hmm. this notion that we have a full cohort of multi-generational practitioners. So in, in the theatre case, where we have practitioners in their 80s. You know, when you think about Uncle Jack Charles and you have people who are going through in terms of youth uh, theatres and things and then all the generations before. Like almost if you just go back to practitioners who were working in the 70s, let's say, and 80s, you know, when you think about the Gary Foley's and then, you know, the Lydia Millers and the Rhoda Roberts, very few of them, they hit this ceiling that meant that somehow society was not ready to shift and the power structures were not ready to shift. And by the time you get to 88, that time between uh, 1988 and 1993, which was the the year of the world's Indigenous people, that five-year period, you, you see um, the, the building of uh, Indigenous theatre companies, dance companies like Bangara, Indigenous galleries were just opening just before then. Bumali is just before 88. But you see this whole shift, and mostly because of the advocacy that came about by the resistance to 88. Mm -hmm. There was a real sense that our, the, our forebears, our people who, people who were our parents, that generation mm -hmm. fought against it because they came across this kind of seal. And I always mm -hmm. love to, to quote um, Kevin Gilbert, Uncle Kevin Gilbert, who, mm -hmm. you know, who wrote one of the, the first Aboriginal plays called The Cherry Pickers in 1968. Mm -hmm. And his saying was, you sharpen your axe on the harder stone. And that there's a sense that advocacy was very much uh, a, a, a very strong kind of um, powerful tool to make change for the next generation to kind of come in. And I think that it's such a great gift, as Nadina's saying too, that, the, that mm. we have our generation now, our 50-year-old and thereabouts, we have this generation ahead of us or a couple of generations hopefully ahead of us and we have this multiple generations behind us that are all practitioners and valuers of arts and cultural activity and that would not be impossible without those kind of number one sometimes quite violent um pushing against the status quo um yeah. and I, you know i i remember the um charlie perkins used to talk about the pendulum swing that you almost have to push the pendulum to the exact opposite position to where you are now to find the middle ground and that the pendulum swing kind of politics and advocacy has created the situation where we are now. Yes, there's still a way to go, but there's a sense that uh, sometimes the violent protest, the, the outrage and kind of emotion also plays a role in, in advocacy. And we, we've got, a, there's a lot of politeness at the moment. If anything, this, this last COVID-19 kind of set of, advocacies where we're incredibly polite where we're using logic and we're putting things out in a very kind of logical way and we're seeing no real take up from policy makers and decision makers and you go oh not that i'm advocating for violence but i'm saying where are the kind of big passionate arguments that happen because i think that often what we're seeing is very polite forms of advocacy and sometimes we need to fight and where how do we fight in this future environment as well anyway going back to that sense of uh, you know as a generation of 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 both beneficiaries of the fights that have gone before but then also the 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 ones who are being made in charge of passing on mm. it's a very interesting middle middle ground and i'm fascinated by that I, i'm also fascinated by what are the new arguments that are coming through Self-determination was the massive um, argument, let's say, that took us through from the 70s, say. Whitlam especially gave self-determination a big boost in the 70s through policy. And then by the time we got into that level, the late 80s, where self-determination was moving into ideas of reconciliation, into the 90s in particular, the sense of reconciliation, for many of us, I think it made made it that we had to step back and share and we're going, well, 
we want, you know, we're moving forward. But we started to go at the, the, the understanding of the least educated. And, you know, in this case, a lot of white people in the country. We had to step back and go, right, we have to share, we have to educate and we have to, so that we can get the next, next level of, of change going. And I'm interested now that um, I did a play called The Seven Stages of Grieving, you know, a very long time ago. And we pointed out the seven phases of Aboriginal history in that where we're talking about dreaming, invasion, genocide, then protectionism, assimilation, self-determination and reconciliation. And this notion now that we might be in an eighth phase of Aboriginal history, which is now sovereignty, this idea of saying, okay, we've tried for generations now to advocate for change. And what we might need to do is actually tell you you're wrong and you have to acknowledge our sovereignty and our power, not our disadvantage and deficit. And so this is a big discussion at the moment because I think through the last 15 years, the closing the gap conversation, the idea that Aboriginal people are, are in a deficit mode, yes, health, mm. education, housing, yes, all of these issues, but therefore all Aboriginal experience is a deficit, is something that we need to rail against a little bit more. And so for me, I'm just going, okay, how do we look at this? And advocacy is not just um, the responsibility of those who are the recipients of the change. It's actually those who are educated, who are in a position of power to advocate for those who are the most vulnerable. And all sophisticated communities think like that. Ultimately, in the last, let's say, you know, since the Howard years in particular, there's been a real sense of victim, um, uh, victim blaming, if you want to call it that, but also this notion of saying, I'm going to take the victim status because even though I'm educated, empowered, incredibly wealthy landowning, I want to feel like I'm hard done by. And there's a lot of conversation that then blames, um, in case Aboriginal people then, for the situation they're in, rather than taking responsibility for the, the political and economic landscape that's been built to privilege the, colonize, the, the colonial project and to disadvantage and disempower this sovereign nation that was here before the colonial power came. There has been no treaty, and that's the big structure that we're talking about going forward. So I, I, I'm interested in, in how sovereignty starts to take charge in all of our advocacy, both through the arts and cultural areas, but then saying, oh, well, um, Mark McMillan talks about this. He says that, in fact, he's a constitutional lawyer, saying that the constitution of the country is, in fact, an illegal document because it has no, um, yeah. no connection with the sovereign nation that was here. There was, terra nullius has meant that there's been no legal structure and by the time the native title legislation came through in 1993, it already was starting to say terra nullius was a myth. And so we're now finding constitutional dissonance that we now need to address and treaty is the way forward. The only way to, to actually have a treaty is to acknowledge the sovereignty of Aboriginal Australia. So we're already in a conundrum. Oh, look, absolutely. Uh, Michael McMillan was, um, of course, the yeah the, the first person I heard speak about sovereignty. Um, it must be more than a decade ago now, and and, and uttered that he was he was the first person I heard utter that very very simple phrase. Sovereignty was never ceded, and yeah. it's when um, you know a phrase like that is uttered very simply, and you think, oh, yes, <laughs> you know, it's not only a massive penny that drops. But it's something that is um, uh, so fundamentally obvious and obviously quite frightening to the kinds of people in political roles who prefer to invert values and put themselves into a, a constructed position of victim rather than mm. think through their privilege. Nadima, there's a number of questions that are coming up on mm. the um, on the chat, but I want to put what what um, what Wesley has said first of all um, to hear mm. your thoughts. And so that move from self determination to reconciliation to sovereignty as being, I guess, three of the key moments in um, a, a focus of uh, First Peoples advocacy, but also um, the butting up against. I, I love that um, uh, that 
uh, line of Kevin Gilbert's sharpening the axe on the hardest stone. Um, that's um, uh, beautifully violent and also really quite, uh, really quite strengthening. Um, mm -hmm. That you can, you know, it's that it's that classic which we've all been telling ourselves over and over again right now. Never waste a good crisis. Uh, this is an opportunity. Let's, um, you know, who who is being focused and how do we focus their minds? Um, Nadina, um, mm -hmm. what strikes you about, I guess, when if, if, if a conversation has, has now shifted towards um, sovereignty, we've had the disappointments of things like um, the Uluru Statement. We've had, uh, at the moment, we have the first, um, the first First Nations Indigenous Australians minister in Australia's mm -hmm. history, and yet he mm -hmm. is um, beholden to a party who has uh, certain views that lock him and so many others out of advancing um, what could and should have been an extraordinarily focusing time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, God, what do we what do we do? Um, well, I've, I've probably got multi sort of layered views on it as well yeah. because. You know, just growing up in, you know, sort of quite distinctly different um, two cultures from my mother's, or three, two cultures from my mother's, um, you know, Yuan side, the salt water side, and then the Gadigal um, side is all connected to that salt water, Bidjigal and Darawal and um, Guru, all of the, and Dar Darawal, that salt water connection that comes from. Sydney and goes all the way down through beyond the Victorian border and all of those song lines and marriage lines through that country. So, and then on my father's side, uh, Wiradjuri country, we have the Snowy Mountains, um, Wiradjuri. So we have a very um, distinct um, Snowy Mountains culture mm. with the Bogong Moth and with all of the mountain range. And, you know, we exist in minus 10, minus 12 degree. Uh, winters it's a painful winter and so to sort of go between those two um, freshwater saltwater mob and then you know back to Sydney for my Gadigal side and my connection through La Perouse and through the Locke family and through like our family goes of course um, back to Maria Locke and um, and we have that industrial history of, it, of my grandfather my other great-grandfather worked in the steel foundries so there's it's, there's a lot of layers but i remember the old people in those times it was sort of like a self-determination because they weren't aboriginal and they weren't australian they were Yuan mm. or they were were Adri. and i think i can see that kind of really localized cultural identity um coming through but it's from a spiritual space it's like we don't need other people to name us for us to know who we are. And it's the practice of being rather than whether the government knows it or not. And I've heard the <laughs> elders sort of say that, you know, we've sat back and we've watched every government, and this legislation yeah. and the white man promise this and then promise that. And they said, and we're still here and our sacred mountain is still there and country is still there. So I sort of feel like culture has its own power to, you know, um, to, to nourish itself and change form and, and um, you know, be like this cultural shield that protects us. Um, and in a way, we have to maintain that insular um, quality because I've seen that in some ways blackness has become the new commodity as well and things that don't really belong to the government are now being sort of basically hijacked by the government in a, in a quasi kind of, oh, now we put on NADOC week. And it's like, so how does a white government organisation hmm. put on NADOC week when they're not a black mm. community? Mm. So I, I'm concerned about black ownership over our cultural yeah. Practices. Oh God, yeah, yeah. That's Nadina, just yeah. before we jump in, uh, there is a question on this that that I, I'm sure will tie in as well, um, which is and accordingly would love to know how is it, and Nadina approached the expression culture wars. She finds yeah. that conservatives increasingly pull that term out as a full stop 
to so many vital discussions. It's so it's something that ends discussions and yet they're so actively engaged in it. But yes, this notion that you can then as a government appropriate. Um, yeah, Wesley. Oh, the idea that in New South Wales in particular, that the, the wonderful thing, which is the Protection of Indigenous Languages Act also makes the New South Wales government the keeper of Indigenous languages. Like it's an extraordinary kind of appropriation of things that are within the community as a form of protection. And it's interesting how cultural knowledge works like that. Um, the, the idea, there's also a question about fake art, which I want to talk about, but the idea yes. of culture wars, culture wars and political correctness, there are all of these terms that get used as a way of mm. saying this is not a valuable conversation. This is not a debate to have. And it's often a protective thing that I go, I don't quite understand. And it's often because they know that they're on the losing side of the debate. Yes. They say, yes. this is all part of the culture wars and therefore we can't win it and so therefore we will denigrate it and stop it from occurring. And, in fact, I think a cultural debate, maybe not a war, but a cultural debate is not a bad thing at all. Because no one wants to say, I don't belong to this country, I don't have to acknowledge the long um, occupation of this country by First Nations people. You know, everyone understands those basic truths. And therefore, if you want to play a opposite position to it, you end up getting this kind of, you know, um, you, you're in the losing side. So they've found ways of shutting down debate so it can fit, fit in their way. And the idea, there's an earlier question around, um, what I'm going to call fake art or the idea that, you know, you buy a piece of, of art, how do you know that it's made by a First Nations person and that they are also the beneficiaries of that sale of that particular art? And there's a whole kind of, there's been, oh, let's say, good 20, 30 years of practice looking at um, the authenticity, um, authenticity um, label. Um, there's some stuff now around lava technology looking at kind of, antecedents of work um it's constantly been the case because again people want to fulfill a market need but not the cultural need they only want half of the equation to be fulfilled because it's of their purpose now as soon as you engage in the cultural need which could be economic it could be just putting food on the table for their families it could also be about the generation of art art making and investing in mm. communities that can make mm. art at a scale and a quality that's ready for whatever the mass market is in that in that case. But you don't want to engage in a cultural conversation, only the economic. And I think Nadina was saying this before, it's like you start to carve up who Aboriginal people are only into these units. And government is fantastic at doing that. Like it's interesting the whole closing the, the gap conversation, Pat Turner lover. This, she was, you know, she's saying, look, the whole closing the gap um, criteria is totally ass about. You've got to shift it so that putting Aboriginal people in the centre, not as statistics that say uh, we want to get education up, you know, education um, participation up. Well, let's just do these pulleys and levers over here. You go, no, no, no. You've got to make sure that those kids have a washing machine to wash their uniforms so they don't feel shame going to school. That was, well, that's one particular anecdotal story from where I grew up because the kids mm. felt shame that they couldn't wear their uniform and they wanted to, to go to school because their washing machine had broken down. So, again, it's a full cultural family environment that you've got to think about, not just about the statistics. And the kind of mm. commodification, as I see Shane writing about now, th this mm. idea of relationship with Aboriginal Australia is only as the product or the mm. economic output and not as the person. And if anything, COVID-19 for me has pushed us back into the idea of actually you've got to deal with the whole person, not just what we can do and how we can contribute to the economy. You know, you've got to look at the complexity of the human and the spiritual sense of being. And it's been that refusal to look at or even bother to grapple with the complexity that's the whole problem, isn't it, Nadina? This sort of, you know, let's just compartmentalise whether it's about, you know, as though life expectancy is an abstract thing that doesn't relate to actual people's lives, but it's just a statistic. Well, you know, like as, as what, um, you know, Wesley was saying about this idea that we can 
somehow quantize or something or, or um, micromanage, move people around and make like broad sweeping decisions. Um, you know, or one of those sort of outcomes that I see a lot is this kind of monoculture view of who Aboriginal people are. It's like, who are these generic Aborigine people? You know what I mean? That um, that just kind of takes away any individuality or any spectrum of, of um, richness. You know, we have such a broad spectrum of, of how do you identify this um, stereotypical um, Aboriginal that doesn't exist? You know what I mean? We're, we're so diverse, even in our own communities and from our own experiences and everything and it's not allowing for us to shape our own um our own practices outside of yeah it being turned into a product and put on a gallery wall somewhere and then the artists um almost being secondary or removed from it and the community having no partnership in place at all with the you know, the, with, with the gallery or the cultural space, and it's more about um, artworks on walls. Uh, and, and you know, I've kind of spoken about about that and said, well, that artwork is, is not just a painting or it's not just, a um, you know, a, a, a work, but it's a, a living document of that community's uh, uh, living culture practice. Huh. Yeah, so, I mean, the wholeness is, is not there. It's kind of there's a, we'll put this in that box and that in that box and then it, it's the value system underneath it is completely different to the Aboriginal community to what, what it is in, in the mainstream community. I, I, I read a paper at the, the CN conference talking about the same thing, about often people get fixated on the artefact, the, the final thing, but in fact, it's the process of making it, the process of painting it, the process of, of sharing it that is actually the cultural knowledge, that this thing at the end mm. is something that's mm. built in the detritus of a, of a process, not the end product. Um, I, I see this mm. question here about how to mm. identify program development and delivery, how to best engage mob in a support, not lead model. And, and this is part of it too, that if you actually go to understand the values of a community and say, you know, what actually is valuable? It might be, yes, we want to sell paintings so that we can have an income stream. That's totally okay. But it would also be, as my experience has been, actually, what are we doing for the young people to make sure things are passed on? Um, how, do we, how do we develop experiences where, or safe spaces for the elders to spend meaningful time with older, with younger people? And so for me, it's really about saying the first conversation is a cup of tea with the people who you want to work with and that you can't do this in isolation. You can't create a program in your head and say that'll work one size fits all. You've got to kind of engage with the community. And so I, I often talk about um, the sideways glance there, Esther, this notion that, you know, I remember doing this show in the Riverland in South Australia and I went down there and I was talking to this elder and, you know, I was talking away, talking away, and he came and he just went me. He went bang, da, 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 and I went, oh, and I right, and I went back to him and I said this and this and this and this and this, and he said, right, okay, now I can trust you. I now know that you will look after what I'm, you will hear it and you will protect it, that he was testing me and giving me this moment of, you know, and some people crumble under that test. You know, someone say, oh, that was too hard, I'll walk away. And you go, well, you are not the person, you are not the champion that I needed, you know, to, to look after what I, what I value. And so there's often this tension between those who want to do well, do good, do good works and help the community, and those who are ready for the testing environments that many elders put us all through and get us through the other side. And so I don't think it's ever easy uh, along the way as well. And, and I think that number one, you just don't, you don't give up. You just keep listening. Is my advice. And the ways in which that listening becomes action, I, that 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 experience of being tested like that um, is obviously really confronting. But 
also, I imagine in that moment, um, Wesley and Nadina, you would have been in that position mm. to where you just kind of, you're testing in, 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 in that way, someone who you know and respect uh, is putting you in a certain position and you're suddenly finding strengths rearranging those that, that, that you know those kinds of values in in in, in different ways um, is that something that um, do you like to test people who you want to become champions and I'm thinking in particular as we know from our conversation last week Nadina was one of the Art Stay on the Hill advocates uh, for last year's adventures in Canberra and Nadina I particularly remember the questions that you kept asking the other artists mm -hmm. Uh, in the group, kind of putting people on the spot to go, okay, you know, what do you believe? How, how are you going to ask this question? It's important, isn't it, to, to test each other like that? Well, um, um, I've been lecturing for two years now in um, decolonizer methodologies in art and design in the, in the university spaces and helping to, you know, embed or support embedding Indigenous perspectives into into these these you know I suppose historically very colonial spaces to start to think more broadly about how Aboriginal people relate to space and community and you know to 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 help to bring a, a stronger toolkit to to uh, what will hopefully become allies and. Um, you know, I, I sort of talk to them about finding your centre because we have to live through that energy of it's not our job. None of us would do it if it was, a, if it was our job. So something has to take on a higher precedence that it's bigger than all of us because it's about that purpose and it's about leaving a legacy and knowing that you're in you know, you, your aim is to enrich or, or help skill skill up mob coming through or, you know, um, just like the elders did for me coming through, you know, where I was sort of, oh, no, that's deadly yet. Yeah, no, we can see you. We see you and we see what you're doing and we're supporting you. And then at the other times I'm still being guided and mentored by my senior elders that are well into their 80s. They call me girl. I'm 50. But um, <laughs> that young girl. <laughs> so I'm having to also then be neutral and understand that I'm not the centre of all knowledge. So there's that humbleness that I have to be able to be a uh, receiver of knowledge. And then at other times, I need to be the person that is leading that space and offering the knowledge. So it's kind of like this duality that you hold and... You know, I also try and ask and connect to spirit to give me, you know, the, the right um, balance of it and not to go into ego too much, you know. Mm. That is, that's such a beautiful and generous way of putting it. And then while you were describing that, I got to thinking about the kinds of people who we're sometimes advocating to, who are politicians, and the kinds of behaviours and values that tend to be rewarded or tend to become, uh, tend to make for success in political life tends to be far too often, I think, Nadina, some of the opposite of what you've just described, which is terrible. When you think about politicians, we, we, we don't tend to think about, um, you know, generosity and vulnerability uh, and uh, humility. We tend to think about ego and a certain kind of forthrightness and a, and a not listening. Um, uh, there's a question which I'm just going to struggle to read. Now, I'm going to ask Nadina and Wesley a special favour here, which is... Um, um, uh, this is very personal, but as you know, I have a brain condition. Uh, my vision has started to fail in the last 20 minutes and uh, I can't see the chat anymore. Um, and so I'm hoping that Wesley or Nadina can see. I know there was a question earlier that was about um, mm. the relationship between... Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Wesley. Yeah, the, the, the notion too of uh, the do you become a, uh, a tool for the political outcome that the politician wants. And, and so often it's been that case too, mm, that, mm. that they're engaging with 
uh, a First Nations debate goal, all that kind of stuff, to somehow for others to to. I don't know, make their reputation on. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of criticism in the tertiary education sector and the university sector around this as well, where people become experts in our culture, get a PhD on our culture, and it becomes a quite challenging thing because other people are seen as the decision makers or the experts and things that First Nations people should be part of. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm related to a politician. I know what politicians look like and that they are <laughs> predictable in the way they go about their business that their job is politics you know so you, my thing is don't ask them to do anything that isn't outside of their job so it, it is difficult because ultimately what happens is you need them to advocate on your behalf and then you're trying to find a mutual benefit relationship with a politician and sometimes that's very hard to find. One of those other questions that was coming through about decoupling the, you know, will political and cultural so sovereignty help decouple the politics from the art and therefore, you know, art will be able to be seen for its artistic and cultural value, not just for its po political or advocacy value in that way. I don't know what you think about that, Nadina. You know, do we ever want our, our art to be decoupled from politics? Because, as you were saying, the, the, the goal of just being, you know, one of the, the effects of being black in this country is that you're immediately political. You know, it's just the nature of being who you are. <laughs> I kind of, um, you know, I, I probably have mixed thoughts on this, but um, I think art is its own entity, you know. It's its own being. And I think if we try and in some ways segment it too much it loses the power of what it is and at any time we try and harness wild spirit um then that spark or life force energy is diminished so i always feel like that um artists are the best ones to decide what happens with the work that they make and um in a way, sort of, the government is having too much control over then what happens. Or so I, I mean, it, I think it's important that it, it it exists within multi spaces and on multi levels. I'm mm -hmm. not really sure what that looks like, but th that it just maintains its integrity. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of comments here too. If they're just talking about how narrowly defined some things are. And, and you were yeah. saying then, Nadina, about how things get, get compartmentalised when they don't really need to be. The whole, the, how we see the whole as there. There's one more question here, Esther. The idea of, um, uh, I'll read it out. As a culturally diverse arts worker that often works with and consults uh, culturally and linguistically diverse youth, young people, uh, sometimes I find it can be hard to engage with communities in a way that they desire to communicate what they want and need you know, a room full of blank faces. Is there something in your experience with regards to your advocacy? Is this ever something you experience as well, Nadina, where you walk into a room and you're trying to get people to understand your perspective <laughs> on this and they just don't, they just don't get it? Um, That's a great question. I used question. to worry about that. <laughs> I think when I was younger, I'd sort of worry about that, but I learned to trust the process, that it's more of a spiritual process. And like we've spoken about before, it's about I'm there to, to do what I need to and it's sort of like this saying of, of set your butterflies free. You know, uh, it, it, it'll go where it needs to go and even at the time you might think, oh, I, I don't know if this is having an impact. The, the trail will come back to you, the circle will come back and someone will say, oh, I was at this talk that you were at and, you know, you something resonated with me in a light sort of, you know, um, triggered and so you know I think it's just important that we believe in that innate beauty and magic of art to do its its you know its um, role in, in healing and, and nurturing and uplifting yeah. and inspiring spirit yeah I've, I've loved oh. that moment, sorry Esther, I've loved at this moment in COVID-19 Nadina this this idea too that we have to be values driven at this point you know, we, let's protect yeah. our people. It's going to cost us $130 billion. Doesn't matter. 
let's protect our people, make sure they're fed and housed and looked after. And it just seeing what Sarah Miller was saying there about, you know, that COVID-19 has shown us that everything is connected. And in fact, this interconnectedness of land and culture, I've personally really appreciated that the ibis, the bin chicken, has got more and more white. It's got cleaner over this last couple of months. <laughs> out of bins, it's feeding in the parks and grasslands, and there's suddenly this sense that the that our removal of the of our garbage has meant that I don't know, the ibis has become more graceful, more beautiful, more full of pride in itself. And so this sense of the interconnectedness of our effect on the landscape and and its effect on us is really quite beautiful. Sorry, Esther, I'm going to stop reading questions and head back to you. Who would have thought a time would come where we could be proud of our Vin chickens and they would herald something positive <laughs> in our lives? Look, it's unbelievable. I, I uh, uh, left Sydney for 20 years and came back recently. I'm now back in Melbourne and um, it felt like the Vin chicken population yeah. had multiplied by 10 in that time. They're extraordinary. <laughs> but just, um, just affecting what you've both been saying, it strikes me then that one of the real conundrums of... Um, you know, our advocacy efforts in general then is about how do we have those complex conversations that are about value, that are about appreciating and dealing with things in a more holistic way when the ways uh, that we need to go about advocacy politically in, 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 in particular are more and more um, striated, specific, broken up, and a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in the next few months, especially when we get to things like the media, like the political processes, uh, the difficulties of meeting with the politician, the submissions process, uh, there are some very specific ways to engage with those long-term, um, you know, policy change processes. But then there are also really sharp, overwhelming, uh, radical, unexpected, game-changing ways um, to create change. And something that Wesley was saying earlier is that, you know, there's, there's very much this politeness at the moment, particularly in this crisis. I think so many of us are, you know, I think it's that absolutely human thing where, you know, here we are in our homes, there is this virus that has uh, no cure, that we have no immunity to. Um, we have no choice at the moment other than um, to trust in our governments to make certain decisions and make decisions in, in Australia's uh, case that are worth $130 billion and still have chosen to exclude some and include others. So how do we, in the structured ways that we have to go about our advocacy, how do we talk about what we're advocating for as well as advocating for that more holistic approach you know how do we cause that glimmer of change in the politician's mind to break out of their own structures and draw on the vision that we need them to have my experience has been left side right side kind of brain thinking you know this notion of um how do you give them the logic and the facts and the complexity based in all of that knowledge? But then how do you give them the emotion and the heart? And often, you know, I'm a storyteller by trade, you know, so the idea of creating narratives and passion, passionate storytelling is seen to be uh, more and more important. And sometimes that can be actually used as a distraction from the very thing you want. I mean, I think that a, a certain American president at the moment uses emotion and radical thought, the lack of logic at times, as distraction, as a way of distracting us from the point that we need oh, to Oh, yeah. Do. I, I call that chaos as a means of control, and I think it's very yeah. calculated. <laughs> agreed, agreed. And so for me, I actually will go in and say, you know, that... Here's the here's the inverted Aboriginal the the the, the pyramid in terms of um, uh, population the inverted pyramid of, of Aboriginal population. Mm -hmm. Here is um, the statistics around homelessness and da da da. Now here's the story of the person. You know, 
here's my story of, you know, even listening to Nadina talk about, you know, her grandmother and her experience makes it kind of sit in your body in a very deep and spiritual way. And I think that, you know, sometimes the things that move politicians more than anything else is that kind of deep spiritual thing that goes, oh, mm -hmm. what, what just shocked me from that story? What made me cry? What made me understand on an emotional level can sometimes be the fuel they need to push through the change. The logic can only talk about their own mutual benefit and how they can get through it. And that's why I think a lot of, you know, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander politics and change are so hard because they only want to deal with the, the things written down on pieces of paper and the surveys and the da da da. But as soon as they meet and understand the story of a family, they go, well, this shouldn't happen. And so for me, it's the right brain, left brain kind of conundrum and the shadow on my face now that I look at it. Um, this, this idea of how we how we provide them with that balance right from the very beginning and not to think that you spend your, and it could only be 10 minutes of a kind of bloody elevator pitch style delivery. How do you make sure you always balance your message so that you can get the biggest change you can out? I think that's a really valuable approach. Um, particularly given if we're talking about politicians and the kinds of meetings they tend to have. These are, if, if we're talking just about a sitting time at Parliament House, it's half hour back to back mm. meetings in the same register, in the same language with people who are coming in out wearing the same things, looking the same way. Um, Nadina, what do you think? Um, how do we shake politicians out of that structure and back into their own culture and into the world? Well, I mean, sim similar also um, to what um, Wesley spoke about, you know, like we have to, like, you know, like I grew up with my grandfather, so I heard a lot of that uh, political st strategizing um, behind what were the approaches, you know, with the Black Caucus and with the you know, with, with that whole sort of um, movement around um, sort of building uh, this black um, independent self-determination, you know, and they talk about things like understanding when you go, when you sit at the table, know what you came there for. So know what you want and already have, you know, researched that person and understand um, what their values are. So that when you're speaking to them, you're speaking their language. So you know, you know, I suppose in marketing terms, their pain points, what they're, <laughs> what they're, um, you know, passionate <laughs> about. And so you can sort of tick those boxes, and you can talk on in their language about things that they're actually it's like a currency. You know, they they um, connect through those energies, whether it's they have a, a strong commitment to. Um, you know, social justice or they have a strong um, focus on um, uh, education or so sort of being able to bring about like uh, the data and the facts. You know, my grandfather would say, know your facts. When you're going to, you know, a, a meeting, know your facts so that you can rattle off your, your data and you can rattle off your statistics around it, but then also solve a problem. So research a problem that they're having and solve it so when they say what do you want say this is what i want and this is the problem that it's solving for you so they used to talk about it like being a chess game so it's a strategy that you play over a period of time and then i suppose you gradually wear them down <laughs> where they start to see that what they're doing is not working and if they shift into this other way of operating, these are going to be all the beautiful benefits that they'll now, now gain. And they'll also be seen as the leader that was the visionary that could move these new benefits instead of doing the same thing and getting the same results. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, let's ask you both then, because it, I'm sure it is almost, um, or we must be approaching wrapping up time. Um, what do you want to see from the youngest generation? Um, 
in your communities beyond um, uh, among First Nations communities in general, but also the, the younger generation um, within your immediate communities. Um, what do you want to see from them as advocates, but also what kind of Australia do you want to see uh, them greet by the time they're your age? Um, I'll jump in there. I think um, it's hard to have expectations of young people that because it's almost their job to rail against us, to do things differently, to think that we have not delivered what they what the world needed. There's almost a passion in young people to overtake um, the ambitions that you know because by the time you get to my age anyway, I feel like I'm weighed down by the compromises of being in the world and going, okay, I'm now reasonable, whereas in my 20s I was unreasonable. And I want young people to be unreasonable around certain things like this as well, not to accept the compromises. So for me, I really want this kind of idea of um, a, a passionate uh, appetite for shifting and changing. And how we're how we're going to get through all that kind of stuff as well, and in many ways, the that whatever they inherit from me, that what we need them to do is to find themselves not obliged to it, that to go okay, that's what you were able to achieve. In many ways, like what our our great 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 grandparents did in terms of their cultural expression is now incredibly different to what we would do. That's the nature of of the adaption and change and understanding of making uh, um, First Nations culture in this country relevant to where we're living today. And I want young people to go, yep, I'll take that and I'll take that and I think that's useful and I'll move that away and I think that's rubbish, you know, and to kind of get this mm -hmm. kind of passion to really engage mm -hmm. and become unreasonable against us and yet still be respectful of the fights we had to go through. So in many ways, I want to say, this is yours. What do you want to do with it? And then find joy in them, you know, mm -hmm. discovering new ways of, of being uh, wonderful about it as well. There's a couple of points here that I want to raise about um, the Ibis, the bin chicken, maybe becoming the <laughs> mascot for climate change and mascot for COVID-19. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But, uh, I mean, of, um, you know, how let young people actually own the world yeah yeah oh, love it except for the bin chickens i cannot that you know we uh, I, I can't imagine them leading us in any, any direction uh as long as like you know it's out of the bin medina unreasonableness i love that oh fabulous you know like i was the young um girl that lived on the mission as a kid you know and I didn't see at that time too many outrageous people in my community. So I decided I was the black Madonna on the mission. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was really outrageous. Wow. I had platinum blonde hair. I pierced my own nose with a needle and, you know, I wore all that. Yeah, I was out there. I just like, you know, I had this real fire to be seen and I had this fire to be me, the individual, you know. And like Wesley saying, you know, it's been such a beautiful privilege and such a beautiful journey to be in this community, you know, in the in to grow up and, and be born as an Aboriginal person in, in this country with our our wonderful uh, rich culture, you know, and to also stand beside our colleagues like Esther and all of our um, our community. I mean, what a what an honour, you know. We, we've changed things together. We stood beside, beside each other. So, you know, I think for the young people to inherit that, as Wesley said, and say, here, this is yours now, you know, um, don't be shame, be game. And just find or make your own path. Be courageous and daring and say, you know, this is my creation and, and just let it guide you and, and find that path for yourself, your truth. 
Oh, I have such massive respect for you both. Before I thank you in a big effusive way, because um, it is almost time to wrap up, I just want to let everyone know what we're in for next week um, in the fourth week of the NAVA Advocacy Program, uh, which is quite different to these first few weeks. This is next week will be the fourth week, and that's, um, again, that kind of fourth week where we do just a, a good free-flowing Q&A of the first three weeks, but we invite a politician and the three politicians that we're inviting over the next little while are the co-chairs of the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Contemporary Arts and Culture that, that we launched as part of last year's Arts Day on the Hill. So next week we'll be joined by um, John Alexander, who's the member for Benelong. He's a co-chair. Um, he's a member of the <laughs> Liberal Party. Um, and he will be with us for a 20 minute conversation. Adina remembers meeting him last year. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, joining also in the conversation will be Zoe McKenzie. Um, and I have just, I'm just going <laughs> to remind myself which of the other colleagues is joining us. It's Darren Rudd. Um, Zoe McKenzie and Darren Rudd are um, both um, independent consultants. They've worked in um, um, uh, policy advice. They've worked in global corporate and um, international communications. Darren's been the director of um, a range of arts and culture and bilateral companies. Um, Zoe is a former policy advisor in arts, communications, education mm -hmm. and law. They are also both board members of the Australia Council, but they're going to be presenting in their independent capacities uh, and having a broad conversation around the state of arts advocacy, uh, looking back on our last few weeks and then looking forward. To guide that discussion, for those of you who are NAVA members, uh, we have released this evening the first part, the first handbook um, of the workshop program that's available uh, on the um, on the NAVA website um, for like in, in the members section only. The recordings, the transcripts, and so on of these um, workshops are available for everyone. Uh, but those handbooks are for NAVA members only. It's very easy to become a NAVA member. As I pointed out last week, uh, it's only seven fifty a month. That's that's where it starts from. That's the cost of a couple of cups of coffee per month. Um, or um, you know, uh, it's yeah. So oh um, oh, excuse me. Um, and so um, that's just our way of making um, uh, both something special for NAVA members and also keeping these conversations uh, open for everyone. The handbook includes a whole lot of practical things and some, there's some exercises. There's also um, the advocacy framework that we discussed last week is in the handbook as well. Um, and then there's, of course, all, all the information about the, the future ones. This has been um, such a great discussion. Can I just um, uh, thank with all my heart Nadina Dixon and Wesley Enoch. Thank you so, so much for this evening's discussion. And thank you, um, guys. Oh, look, I mean, to be able to talk about, um, you know, the personal, the political, but also, you know, just some of the big things that, that weigh upon us and to end... Um, in, in a way that invites our next generations to, to unsettle and to rethink, I think is just uh, one of the greatest gifts. So enormous thanks, Nadina and Wesley. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. And thank you to everyone who has joined us again. Um, my apologies, I can no longer see the chat. I'm going to say a general goodbye and then I'm going to have a pause and then I'm going to ask my colleagues how to shut this down because I can no longer see very well. So uh, <laughs> goodbye, everyone. Please go away so that you don't see the embarrassing <laughs> part of us trying to shut this down. And let's see you again next week at the same time uh, for the fourth week uh, of the advocacy section of our, of our advocacy program. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>